Okay, um, hello JLF 2017 and welcome Paul Beatty. Paul Beatty breaks every stereotype of a novelist writing today. After being rejected by multiple publishers, he took the literary world by storm with his path-breaking novel, The Sellout, becoming the first American to win the Booker Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Let's give him a big hand. The novel is a satire set in a suburb of LA called Dickens. The main character, determined to get his town back in the map, decides to reinstitute segregation and is charged for slaveholding. This character is himself African American. His father, a behavioral psychology professor in a nondescript university, uses him as a guinea pig for a number of highly troubling experiments. Even more audacious is their neighbor, Harmony Jenkins, a child star who believes that he was born to be a slave and volunteers himself as a slave of the narrator. This book will make you flinch, laugh, squirm, and cry all at the same time. It is a great honor to be in conversation with the creator of this reckless and comically genius piece of writing, Paul Beatty. Let's welcome him once again. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to start the session with a reading by Paul Beatty, and here's your book. Okay. So he's going to be reading from the sellout. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning. Uh, just you don't really need to know anything except that the main character is in the he's in the courtroom of the Supreme Court of the United States. He's been smoking weed, so he's kind of high. So nothing, nothing makes sense. That's the bitch of it, to be on trial for my life and for the first time ever not feel guilty. That omnipresent guilt that's as black as fast food apple pie and prison basketball is finally gone. And it almost feels white to be unburdened from the racial shame that makes a bespectacled college freshman dread fried chicken Fridays at the dining hall. I was the diversity the school trumpeted so loudly in its glossy literature but there wasn't enough financial aid in the world to get me to suck the gristle from a leg bone in front of the entire freshman class. I'm no longer party to that collective guilt that keeps the third chair cellist, the administrative secretary, the stock clerk, the not that really all attractive, but she's black beauty pageant winner from showing up for work Monday morning and shooting every white motherfucker in the place. It's a guilt that has obligated me to mutter my bad for every misplaced bounce pass politician under federal investigation, every bug-eyed and Rasta-voiced comedian, every black film made since 1968. But I don't feel responsible anymore. I understand now that the only time black people don't feel guilty is when they've actually done something wrong. Because that relieves us of the cognitive dissonance of being black and innocent. And in a way, the prospect of going to jail becomes a relief. In the way that cooning is a relief, voting Republican is a relief, marrying white is a relief albeit a temporary one. Uncomfortable with being so comfortable, I make one last attempt to be at one with my people. I close my eyes, place my head on the table, and bury my broad nose in the crook of my arm. I focus on my breathing, shutting out the flags and the fanfare, cull through the vast repository of daydream blackness until I dredge up the scratchy archival footage of the civil rights struggle. Handling it carefully by its sensitive edges, I remove it from its sacred canister, thread it through mental sprockets and psychological gates, and pass the bulb in my head that flickers with the occasional decent idea. I flip on the projector. There's no need to focus. Human carnage is always filmed and remembered in the highest definition. The images are crystal clear, permanently burned into our memories and plasma television screens. That incessant Black History Month loop of barking dogs, gushing fire hoses, and carbuncles oozing blood through $2 haircuts. Colorless blood spilling down faces shiny with sweat and the light of the evening news. These are the pictures that form our collective 16 millimeter super ego. But today I'm all medulla oblongata and I can't concentrate. The film inside my head begins to skip and sputter. The sound cuts out and protesters falling like dominoes in Selma, Alabama begin to look like Keystone Negroes slipping en masse on an affirmative action banana peel and tumbling to the street 
a tangled mess of legs and dreams akimbo. The marchers on Washington become civil rights zombies, 100,000 strong, somnambulating lockstep onto the mall, stretching out their stiff, meaty fingers for their pound of flesh. The head zombie looks exhausted from being raised from the dead every time someone wants to make a point about what black people should and shouldn't do, can and cannot have. He doesn't know the mic is on. Under his breath, he confesses that if he only tasted the unsweetened swill that passed for iced tea at the segregated lunch counters in the South, he would have called the whole civil rights thing off. Before the boycotts, the beatings, and the killing, he places a can of diet soda on the podium. Things go better with Coke, he says. It's the real thing. Thank you. So Paul, what made you write The Sellout? What has been your main inspiration for writing this book? Uh, I, I, I didn't have any money, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't write very often, you know, and um, I get, you know, these little ideas come to me in dribs and drafts, and uh, usually it's about every five years or so they kind of accumulate, and, uh, and it just starts spilling out of me, and I just start writing. I mean, there's no, like, one thing that goes, okay, I have to start writing now, or this is, you know, it, it takes a long time for the story just to coagulate and start forming in my head, and so I don't, there's not, like, a specific thing, really. So it isn't like one particular thing, but almost like a lifetime of observation yeah. that has turned into this book. Now, you have some very interesting characters in the book. Are any of them based on real people, people who you know? Uh, or are they completely a figment of your imagination? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> really just the, uh, the female lead is based on my wife a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my sister and... Uh, one of my best friends growing up and his sister. She's, she's a, a compilation of all of them, I think. But that's, you know, and there's some unnamed historical characters. Mm -hmm. No one really gets named in the book that are, of course, based on some people. And so who was your first reader? Who was the first person to read the sellout and what was their reaction? Yeah, uh, the first person was my editor. So. Oh, sorry. And what was their reaction? Yeah. He, because uh, it's, it's such an unusual book that I'd love to know what sort of, how did they react? Yeah, he called me up, and I was in Los Angeles at the time, and he called me up, and he just went, you're so fucked up. <laughs> 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 and uh, but he was like, that's a good thing. And, uh, and, and so, I mean, because, you know, at some level, I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but. Um, I think we're allowed to say it. Uh, yeah. the, no, not, not, not so much the swearing, but uh, I'm not going to be so humble, I guess, for a second, but. You know, I, I think I knew I had worked really hard on this book, and I knew I'd written a good book somewhere in the back of my head. So, you know, I was worried about, like, you know, does it translate? And uh, when he said that, I was like, okay. But then he said, you know, it's so contradictory. It's so full of hypocrisy. And he goes, but it all makes sense. And when he said that, that was, that was really important for me because it's not like this just straight ahead, you know, kind of epistemological way of thinking, you know, like on a single line. It's not that, you know, the book thematically and ideologically moves all over the place. And so when he said that and that it, the fact that it kind of coalesced, that made me relax a little bit. I mean, every single page of this book is surprising. There's nothing about it which doesn't make you just question and think about everything in 10 different ways that you never thought of before. So I think it must have been quite nervous. I mean, you must have been nervous when you first... Yeah, I wasn't nervous, really. I mean, um, no, no more nervous than I've ever been, really, I don't think. But um, I mean, how did you perceive the book when you sent it to the first reader? Because I know that the novel has been described as a satire. You've been compared to Swift. But you said in an interview once that you didn't consider the book to be satire. No. Nah, I mean, so were you surprised at people's reactions? No, I can't say I was surprised at anyone's reactions, really. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things with satire... I just write, you know, I write the way that I write. And for me, it's interesting that people are so quick to place that label on this book. It's not like it's a bad thing necessarily, but for me, I'm just, it's funny, a friend of mine, because I've been talking about this so long, and he goes, oh, you sound just like Nabokov in this TV show. So that's on my mind, he sent me this tape. And Nabokov is talking about Lolita as a satire. People like critics <laughs> calling it a satire. I never think of that book as a satire. We were just talking about that. And he said a thing, he just goes, yeah, I'm just writing. I'm not writing to change anyone's mind or to change your heart. And I'm not, I just, I have a story to tell and that's it, you know. And then, you know, I was watching the news a couple weeks ago and I was watching CNN. 
and they had like wrangled one of these fake news people, somebody who puts out fake yeah. news, and he's sitting in his chair like this, and, uh, and they said, well, why are you doing this? Why do you do this? And he goes, uh, it's just satire, you know, and so that word, like people just hide behind that word so much, you know. Why, and, why do you think that is? Is that because you think sometimes when somebody is saying something which is difficult for people to digest, they can take it and internalize it easier if you call it satire? Yeah, I mean, I think you can do a lot. You don't have to be very specific, you know? Uh, and it's easy to use that word. It's like a shotgun blast, you know? It's not like a sniper shot, you know? It's like a very big thing. And so I think, it's, you're, I think you've answered your own question in a weird way. I think it makes it easier to talk about, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, you know? Uh, but I think that's part of it. And I just, I don't want to be a satirist, you know, I don't want to be the person, and there comes with like an entertainment aspect of that that yeah. I'm very uncomfortable with, you know, I don't want to do the Mark Twain tour at the end of his life, you know, <laughs> <laughs> wear a seersucker suit, you know, and try to earn my keep that way, I just, I don't want to do that, so. It's interesting you say that, because when I, when I read your book, I remember thinking that there's, there's something in it which, it seems like you really don't like labels, you know, and Tell us a little bit about that. Where, where does that urge come from? Uh, that's a really good question. Because novels today, I mean, I work in publishing, so I, I guess we're all a little bit guilty of that, is sometimes when you do, can't easily classify something, you don't know what to call it. And it seems like you want to evade every single label through your writing. Uh, yeah, for me, it's not so much about evading the labels, although that's part of it. But, you know, it part seems like you almost cringe from them. <laughs> yeah, I do, because, you know, they've been used it just in my day to day life so much yeah. and being boxed in about what things mean. And it just it gets hard. And I use these words and I don't even know what they mean anymore. So I try to, you know, I, I write about like that frustration, you know, just being lost. And how can I talk about these issues in a way that's different than they've been, dis you know, than the discourse has gone before, you know. And so part of it is you know, like using these labels. So I'm gonna tell a long story for a second. I used to write poetry. And I did a poetry reading in Minneapolis and there were a bunch of people there and there was a black guy and his girlfriend were sitting in the front row. And then so after I was done, his first question to me goes, are you one of those new Negroes? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but it's like that label of this thing. And then, like, so for me, it's like these labels are, are this constant effort to, uh, humanize and redefine and all this kind of stuff and as a way of trying to show progress and I don't really see any of that. So I, they just, and they're also divisive for me, you know, some of the labels yeah. and just, it's not like I never use them. Like I'm not trying to say I don't use them, but it's, it's something that I do avoid or if I use the label, then it doesn't mean what you think that label is gonna mean, you know? And why, so. Why do you think people are so attracted to labels? Is it because it helps them process People were different. I mean, why do you think people need labels so badly? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just part of how conversation works. I mean, it's hard to have conversations about difficult subjects without talking in generalities. It's just difficult, you know. But it's also usually not very fruitful, you know. And so, you know, the language is, is, is a part of why I do it, you know, because yeah. I, I love the challenge of the language, yeah. you know. And, and it's like, how can I recast the language that, you know, we're all used to and either ignore that or, you know, reposition it, you know, so we look at it through a different framework. So, yeah, I, I don't have answers for any okay. of this. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll ask you a different question. Um, coming back to language, the book is a, a linguistic masterpiece. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your writing process? I mean, do you just let it flow or do you revise? How do you write? Wait. I think there'll be a lot of writers in the audience, are there? published, unpublished? Are there a lot of you wanting to write novels? Don't be shy, raise your hand. I think they'd love some advice from you. So let me ask, can I go back to the labels yes, for one second? Yes, you can. Sorry. <laughs> so th in this book, Mark Twain comes up a little bit. And uh, there was a period, I don't know, about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, where they had rewritten, someone, I, I'm using the amorphous they, someone had rewritten, uh, Huckleberry Finn, <laughs> and they kind of made a politically correct version of that book. And I had a friend who wrote an essay about how he was in favor of this book. He's black and he has two kids. 
And he says, I love this book, but, you know, it has words like nigger in it, and I don't know how to read it to my kids. And that just really sat, because that label meant something for him. Yeah, I mean, well. yeah, I mean that, and that label, you know, that word means something for him, you know, and it means something to me, too. But I, I, I think part of for me is, like, I don't want the power behind those labels ne doesn't necessarily have anything to do with me, you mm -hmm. know, and so it's, it's interesting for me to see a book that, however old that book is, you know, to, that the person kind of wants it to disappear. Like he wants it to, he, you know, he wants like a, this weird historically abridged version of a book he likes. I just, I just didn't understand that. And so for me, it was like, let me talk about at least this word as a label in an in a interesting way, you know, and it, I mean, it comes, I don't want to reread the book, but for me, it's just, it's just interesting how people cringe from these things. I mean, because they hurt. The labels oftentimes hurt, you know. And, uh, and I, I, just, I, I just understand, I don't understand bearing the labels that you don't like and try to reinvent kind of meaningless labels to mm -hmm. recast, your, you know, how other people perceive you. I do understand the process. But there's something, ah, disingenuous isn't the right word. They're just, it's such a clear... I don't know. I, I mean, it's, you're, you're trying to reconstruct your reality, you know, and kind of, you know, always have the lens focused in the way that you want to be focused. Like, this is the, pr the pr picture I want to present. You know, and I think that also has impacted on, like, why I write the way I do, mm -hmm. you know, because there was a label of what a black writer is supposed to write like. Yeah. You know, and that was something I really struggled with for a long time. So what is a black writer supposed I, to write? Just, like? You're supposed to write whatever you want to write. Hmm. No, I mean, know? I'm just quite interested in the stereotype, and, the, and you've, of course, broken that. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you that I think that uh, there, there are expectations and uh, labels around people, and that is quite stifling for writers. I yeah, think. yeah. No, I, yeah, it's not, it's not like an African-American thing or anything. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's anytime you're create, trying to do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, I, I found myself bumping up against what I'm supposed to say, how I'm supposed to say it. And, yeah, yeah this is, I could talk forever about this and not make any sense. But, <laughs> you know, part of me was like, you know, for me was the challenge of, so I'm going to throw out the word label and just use language. Okay. And so for me, I have the language, you know, the language of my house, the way my mom talks to me the way I talk to my sisters. You know, I have the language of growing up in Los Angeles, which is a whole nother, yeah, there, I mean, there's a number of different things happening at one time. Then there's like a, a political rhetoric that I have. You know, then I have another, you know, educational rhetoric that I have. And for me, I, I hear all these things at once. And I always found like, you know, people felt like they had to be in one lane. You know, everything's in one lane, everything's in one lane. And for me, it, the struggle was how can I like twist all these threads and turn them into this one skein of language, you know? And yeah, so it's not the label so much, it's the language behind the label, who's using the label, because the labels don't mean one thing all the time, you know? They mean something if you say it, they mean something if I say it, they yeah. mean something depends on who's listening, you know? So, so yeah, it's like if I use these words, I'm trying to, give, not definitions, but different kinds of context all at once, you know? And that's hard to do, I think, you know? I know I'm not making any no, sense, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, I mean, I think you, you're coming back to what we were talking about, which is, again, language, is that the way you have challenged, the, you, it's a very challenging way of using language. And, so, and it's also a very emotional way of using language, just hearing you talk about it right now, reading the book, it is extremely emotionally charged. And I remember reading somewhere that the book took a very strong emotional toll on you. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, how was it emotionally writing this book? Yeah, that's a, um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm asking you to be yeah, a difficult a, question. For me, it's not, it, the process is, I just write it. You know, I do whatever it takes to put my butt in the chair and write. And so for me, it's, you know, I'm editing and I'm writing. And I, the reflection comes after, you know. That's when I start coming up with the bullshit about why I did it, who I did it for. You know, it's all sort of true, but not really true. And so, I mean, I worked, I mean, I always work really hard, but this was like as close as I'd come to rendering what was in my head onto the page, you know? And I was in Detroit in Michigan, 
in this college, Mary Grove College, did this really nice thing where they had given my books to the high school, high schoolers in Detroit, to the whole city school. And so they had a nice reading. And so I hadn't read from this book at all. And I, it was still in, you know, typewritten pages. And I just started reading the book. And I, I was like two pages in, and I just started crying so much. And then one was just, man, how close I was. And I couldn't stop crying. It was weird. So I felt like I had to explain to them. But it was, you know, trying to render this difficult, impossible to talk. Like, I can't talk about it now. I mean, that's why I write. Yeah. You know, and, it's, and I was like, man, I'm actually articulating this complete, absurd, nonsensical stuff in a way that's hopefully not didactic. Mm -hmm. all the time, but, you know, has that emotional charge. That's what Nabokov said. He talked about, he's just trying to tell the story. He's just trying to tingle the bottom of the reader's spine. You know, it's not like this big message or anything. And for me, there was that tingle. Like, I was feeling that, oh, that tingle. You know, like, mm -hmm. when I go to a good Mizuguchi movie, I get that tingle. And so, it was, for me, it was nice to, to realize I had done that, at least for myself, as a reader and a writer. Now, um, tell me about Hominy Jenkins. Mm. One of the strangest characters I have ever come across. <laughs> Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about Hominy Jenkins and where did you get the idea of such a person from? Yeah. yeah that can't have <laughs> been based on a real person. <laughs> uh, in, in a weird way, it is. Do you is. want to just describe Hominy Jenkins a yeah, little bit? Yeah, I, I don't know how to describe it. I'm the worst person to talk about my <laughs> books, I'm sorry. So Hominy's a guy, in the States, there's a, 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 there's a show called The Little Rascals which is just, uh, it was a, these one real movies from the 30s and the 40s, even into the early 50s, but these little kind of street urchins. And there's always a couple of African-American black little rascals. And so the most famous of them is Buckwheat. So in the States, he's this kind of iconographic figure of black buffoonery, all these kind of things. But me and my sister have always loved this show, as racist as it is. <laughs> and, but there's a, there's a lot going on in the show. And then so one day I was, and so what happened was Buckwheat was part of a legacy. Because once the kids go too tall or too old, you know, they substitute they another kid. Them. So there was always a black male in these things. And then so, you know, when the racial climate changed in the States, I, I wondered who was that next person in line to be the next Buckwheat, you know. And uh, that just, I just loved the idea of Buckwheat's understudy. And like where that person would be now. And uh and it's also based on a guy who lived on my block in a weird way. So I, I grew up in Los Angeles, so you know movies are a big part of LA. So there was a guy named Eddie Smith, who in the 70s started the Black Stuntman's Association. So it was a group of Hollywood black stuntmen. I don't know how much they worked, but they had an association. And so me and my friends would always run to his house because he, he would always tell us he's gonna put us in the movies. So I know you've read the book, so this might resonate a little bit. But he was a really nice guy. Of course, he never put us in the movies. <laughs> but he was a, a real figure for us. And then those same friends are the friends that I used to watch The Little Rascals with. So all this stuff kind of comes together. And, you know, and, 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 and part of it is, so I'm working on this, on this anthology of non-black people writing about black people, you know, for the past 200 years. And globally, you know, not just Western. And so for me, it's really interesting to see how has that perception of blackness changed? What are the roles these characters take in stories? And then so Hominy for me is like this weird contemporary figure of what progress is in terms of the perception of black progress is. You know, he's a guy who's had all these really subservient roles, but he's really talented, he's super smart, super bitter, but he has this kind of quirky streak in him, you know? And I also love the idea of a, of a, you know, a supposed slave who's masochistic, who enjoys being beat. You know, I love the idea of an African-American who owns a slave. And, and these are all based in historical reality at some level, mm -hmm. you know? But there are little things that people don't talk about, don't allow our things, or, you know, ourselves to, to go to. And I'm gonna try not to say stuff that's gonna get me in too much trouble, which <laughs> I'm doing a decent job of so far. <laughs> But you know, the, the thing is, I have a thing of that people equate suffering with nobility all the time. Mm -hmm. And it, somebody's nodding. And you know, because we were talking about like what makes things easier to read. And that's one of those things. So that's something, it's not like I'm consciously trying to avoid that. 
but it's a sort of, for me, it's a sort of pandering that I don't like to do. It's just not very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And it's that thing, I saw a bad movie once called Sideways, which is not going to mean anything to anybody. It's a movie I didn't like particularly. Some, it sounds like someone's been watching <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I can hear someone laughing in the audience. But it's, 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 you know, it's like, you know, it does what entertainment does is, you know, it affirms these myths that we want to want to believe. And I went, man, when I came out of that movie, I said to my friend, I was like, man, there's a lot of money to be made in making smart people feel smart. <laughs> you know, and, and then, you know, you kind of just tell them what they want to hear in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, I, I try not to do that at level. I mean, I think it ends up doing that anyways, you know. <laughs> but it's, I, I try not to pander in that weird way. And so Hamid's a person who, he wants that attention, but he doesn't know how to foster it. You know, mm -hmm. he doesn't know how to, I, it's hard to, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a complex here. I'm doing a terrible job. You know, one of the lines that really stuck with me and um, is when the narrator ominously says, I've whispered racism in a forced racial world. Um, why this was interesting to me was that essentially the, the, in certain bubbles, people like to believe that we live in a post-racial world, but w reading your book will shatter that illusion. Do you think a post-racial world is ever possible? No, I mean, it depends what you mean by post-racial. Yeah, I don't what know what that what means. I don't know. I mean... He's avoiding the label again. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it just, it just, it doesn't, I don't get any enjoyment from using these. They don't... They don't mean anything to me, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, Time Magazine put this thing, you know, uh, this is what humanity is going to look like, and it looks yeah, like yeah, somebody yeah. who looks like you, right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but you know, that's 300, 400, the thousand years away, like, why are we pretending? It doesn't even mean anything. Right, exactly, yeah. you know, uh, so I try not to do that. Now I've forgotten what you've asked me. Oh, is there going to okay, be a... We'll move on. I think the yeah. answer is no, is what I'm trying okay. to say. Now, you are the first American to win the Man Booker Prize. How did that feel when you won that prize? Can you share some of that excitement? I think we all saw your very emotional acceptance speech. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how that felt. I mean, it felt good. I mean, it's, you know, I, I worked hard, so it's nice to be recognized for something. Um, you know, and it's, and it's a hard book to read. You know, on a lot of levels, it's a hard book to read. You know, it's, I, 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 I learned a while ago that I'm just always uncomfortable, and that's, that's where I write from, is a place of discomfort. And it's, but it's not, it's, for me, it's, it's really nice to know that, that, you know, that a book as difficult as this, as hopefully as challenging as this book is, has get some general recognition, you know, which doesn't happen to me very often, you know. But uh, so that, I mean, it's really nice to know. I mean, I, as the American thing doesn't really mean so much to me, to be honest, you know. Uh, it's not like I do, I'm an, am an American, but it's, that's not that important to me. I could really yeah. care less about that, you know. I'm glad that the award was opened up. I mean, it's, you know, opened up doors for me and all that. So, oh, that's really good. But um, it, it's, 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 and it's also not, I mean, look, I'm in India, I'm in Jaipur, and people are reading my book. And it's, it's one of those things, you know, I teach at Columbia. My students are always trying to appeal to everybody. Am I likable? So, so you teach Can you like this? I, I do, Columbia. I do. And you know, I, I, I try to tell them, it's like, you know, readers pick up on what you're interested in. And if you're trying to pander them, people see through you yeah. right away. And you know, this is a book that somebody could easily say, oh, it's not translatable. It has no appeal to anyone outside these 10 blocks where it takes place, you know. It's, it's never true. I mean, things that are good are good, and things that are bad are bad, you know, whatever side you're on on that. So for me, that was really nice. I mean, it was, I didn't expect to win, so it was a, a pleasant surprise. So uh, I want to ask you a little bit about teaching creative writing. Um, there, there are lots of writers in the audience today. Can you give them some advice? <laughs> yeah. I don't have any general advice. I mean, you know, so what, do you, what do you tell your students about writing? I books? tell them all different things. They all need different things. You know, they're all coming from different places. You know, they have different needs, different things that they're trying, different obstacles that they're trying to hurdle. So they all need different things. And so for me, the things that have helped me, mm -hmm. and it's really simple, is uh, when I was writing, learning to write, and trying to figure out what I was doing, uh, I had a professor tell me, she told me to stop writing. Because I was so worried that no one was understanding what I was doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I wrote a poem once. 
and at, you know, we talk about the poems, and there was this kid in the class who was like, I hate that poem. I have no idea what you're talking about. This means absolutely nothing. I'm completely confused. You know, nothing. And then so that was at the end of my first year. Then so summer went by, and I had the same group of students in a class with Allen Ginsberg. And he said, well, bring in your best poem. And for me, that was the first thing, the best thing I'd written. I read the same poem, and then the same kid who hated the poem before at the end of the class was like, I love this poem. This is genius. Paul's doing this. This applies. This is a historical right. You know, he got it from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And I went, whoa. And I asked him, I was like, well, what happened? You hated that poem three months ago. And then he just said, yeah, I was in New York for three months. You know, my ears. And then just something clicked in me about, doesn't mean like whatever I'm doing is correct, but just that the stream runs both ways at the same time. You know what I mean? And just clicked. And I had a professor who I'm still close with, his name is Lou Asikoff, a poet. And he told me, people will learn to read me. And that was so, I mean, just relaxed me. It just totally relaxed me. And then he told me the thing that's most important, which is just, it's really simple, which is writer's right. That's it, you know? There's, for me, there's no secrets, you know? Yeah. Um, today is, I'm mean, just gonna change the subject from writing for a second, because tomorrow Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States of America. And the conversation about race has re been, has reached a completely new dimension in the US. But at the same time, all uh, racial injustice is so much more visible. It, it's possible that it's the same as it always was, but it just seems so much more visible. What should America and the world expect? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have. <laughs> Keep the covers over your head, I don't know. It's, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I think, like, it's more than the, the race thing, you know, and it's like, yeah, I don't even know where to start with this. I mean, the, yeah. Are you going to be watching the inauguration on TV? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's going to be, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm going to laugh, cry, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I once realized that whenever that atomic mushroom cloud is in the sky, I just want to have a good view, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's nowhere to go, really. You know, the world is so small. I just, you know, so that's maybe, I don't know. Maybe this is, why, I don't know, what the Enola Gay, maybe he's, I don't know. But uh, I'm, I'm going to watch. I think, I have no idea what time it's going to be on here, but. It'll uh, be tomorrow night. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm going to watch. But I, I don't know what to expect, you know? But, you know, I think that anger, that fear, that, you know, he kind of personifies, it's not just in the US. I mean, it's, yes. you know, it's all over. It's always present, you know, and then every now and then people feel emboldened or comfortable enough to, you know. Yeah. And what is driving that, you think? Uh, hey, yeah, it's, it's a lot of insecurity, you know. It's, I mean, as, you know, as an American, you know, there's this myth of what America is, what it's supposed to be, and of course it's never existed. You know, but it's difficult to accept that something you believe in doesn't exist or isn't what you thought it was, you know? And then so I think, you know, we often find ourselves trying to leech on to something that gives us a semblance. Because it's a weird way of being empowered in a weird way. Yeah. You know, I once heard a guy telling a story about this small town and these poor black guys sit in front of this store, you know, and their train comes by at 2.30 every day, you know, in the afternoon. And they sit in this front. And he goes, when they would start to hear the train, they would talk about the train. He goes, oh, the engineer's not racing. That engine is right today. He's doing this. They were criticizing the train because they had nothing else. But that gave him a semblance of power to talk about this train, you know, it's 30 seconds late, whatever it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think we all do that at some level of trying to, because, you know, you want to feel like you're here for a reason or that you have some say-so, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Trump. I, 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 I I mean, the thing I said, I'm, I feel bad about saying it, but you know, in the States, there's this phenomenon of people taking pictures of their penis, and you know, they send it online, dick pics, whatever. Right? He's kind of like an American dick pic. <laughs> you know, it's out there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, some people are proud of it, some people are like, you know, <laughs> but it's out there, you know, and, you know, and at some level you go, this is what it looks like, you know, and, uh, so it's like look away now or don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, when I, I I had class the next day and I showed up, and uh, 
my, I mean, they were in tears. I mean, it didn't hit me like that, you know. And, and you know, because they were scared, you know. They, they come from different backgrounds, different orientations, you know. And it was a thing that, you know, had, you know, a schism in their families. You know, my mom and dad think one way, I think another way. And just, you know, and they were like, yeah, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And, and for me, I'm not like one of those people who tells people, oh, you got to fight back or, you know, you got to, it's just not me. But the thing I told them was, you know how afraid you are of losing these things? This is just think about why you write. You know, how important this stuff is to you. And just how tenuous this is. Not like Trump can take that away from you, but just how important this thing, this yeah. is, you know. And yeah, I, I, Obama said some things, you know, the day after he won, and the sun will come up tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, he's supposed to say that. And uh, yeah, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think, I don't operate that way, you know. Uh, I'm pessimistic, I guess. But for me, it's, it's just these things of, sometimes you need these reminders of how important things are to you. And it's, and it's hard to hold on to those. I mean, that's the hard thing. And, you know, um, I think one of our frailties in a weird way, even though it's a strength, is that we adapt so readily to whatever is going around. So it's a blessing and a curse. It, sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Will you read us the last section of your book? Oh, sure, sure, sure. And then we'll open it up for audience questions. So there's like a big... Uh, social psychological kind of undertone to the book, you know, based on the character's dad. So uh, this is a section called Closure. I remember the day after the black dude was inaugurated. Foy Cheshire, proud as punch, driving around town in his coupe, honking his horn and waving an American flag. He wasn't the only one celebrating. The neighborhood glee wasn't O.J. Simpson getting acquitted or the Lakers winning the 2002 championship, but it was close. Foy drove past the crib and I happened to be sitting in the front yard husking corn. Why are you waving the flag, I asked him. Why now? I've never seen you wave it before. He said that it finally felt like the country, the United States of America, had finally paid off its debts. And what about the Native Americans? What about the Chinese, the Japanese, the Mexicans, the poor, the forest, the water, the air, the fucking California condor? When do they collect, I asked him. He just shook his head at me, said something to the effect that my father would be ashamed of me and that I'd never understand. And he's right, I never will. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thank, you. thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you. Um, we're gonna have audience questions. Can you please identify yourself and keep it to a question and not a statement? The gentleman who's seen the movie you referred to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but not about the movie. I love the book. Uh, can't remember the last time a book made me laugh so hard. Uh, my question was about political correctness, especially in the context of race relations. Because um, your book, of course, is completely politically incorrect and almost defiantly so. Uh, but where do you, uh, how do you speak to a view that I've often, well, at least at times heard expressed, that political correctness in the US, in the context of race relations, has almost done more harm than good? Yeah, I mean, so that's like one of these words, post-racial, political correctness. Yeah. And I go, I don't know what this means. You know, maybe I knew what it meant for a week, you know. And so, you know, you, we were talking about Trump, and I watched Trump. And if we just divide the world up into assholes and quasi-assholes. You, know, <laughs> you really are you know, he, he's, he, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got his own sense of political correctness. But, how, you know, and I think, you know, it's like they use that word and turn the meaning around, you know, where it was like about, hey, let's at least try to show a diversity of opinion. Let's, let's at least try to acknowledge that, you know, within the context of the classroom, we shouldn't address people by such and such. You know, but now this thing means all these other things that the word, at least in my understanding, it wasn't supposed to mean. Having said that, it's, you know, I think some people feel like, Part of the, you know, Trump's appeal is people feel censored. Feel censored. Yeah. And I, I suppose I can understand that. But it's interesting that what are they censored from, you know? And so yeah. I don't know how to, how to respond to that. So, so, you know, we're talking about teaching. And, you know, I, I encourage my students, you've got to take risk, which doesn't necessarily mean being politically incorrect. You know, everyone's got a different sense of risk. But those risks are going to be different for everybody. So... I'm not sure how to, how to talk about this, but I taught a class on LA about Los Angeles. I gave them 
some politically incorrect books. And I, I taught a satire class. And then so one of the books that I had them read was uh, Philip Roth's Portnoy's Compliant, because it was an important book for me. And so it was interesting to see the women in the class. And so there was one woman who was very offended by the book, and we talked about that. Yeah, you should be offended. There's no reason. No one can tell you not to be offended, whatever that means for you. But there were a ton of women who were like, shit, what is it with, not that they wanted to write like that, but they went, oh, you know what? I'm not supposed to write like this. I'm not allowed to write like this. What is this, what's this happening in me that is preventing me from just breaking these barriers, you know? I'm not sure that's political correctness, but a little bit of it is, that fear. You know, we we're talking- fear of offending. That fear of offending or that just, even just ignoring things, to, just to go, hey, I'm pissed off, then all of a sudden you're being politically incorrect. So part of this book comes from a conversation I had with a student. I was, me, him, and a Mexican-American friend of mine named Oscar. We're talking to him. And he looked at me, and he, went, he said to us, he goes, oh, I feel so sorry for you guys. And we're like, he's 25, you know, I'm 54, Oscar's in his late 40s. And we're like, why do you feel sorry for us? He goes, oh, you guys must have had it so hard back in the day, all the racism and stuff. And me and Oscar <laughs> just started laughing, you know, like we were runaway slaves or something. But, <laughs> but we looked at him, and we went, no, it's harder for you. Because you don't even know how centered you are in terms of what you're allowed to say. We're like, it's, you know, we didn't, we could at least yell or whatever. You know, we had these other legacies that we could fall back on. And, and for me, that's like this weird other kind of how political correctness has shaped and how people perceive the world. So it's interesting to see that. Yeah. So I'm going to tell another quick story really quickly. Please. So I had a student. Uh, he's an excellent writer. And he wrote the story that I was always really afraid that I was going to get. And he wrote a story about a black guy raping a white woman. It was the crux of the story. And then so we read this story. I read it. I went, oh, fuck. I don't want to have to deal with this. But <laughs> So we read the story. And, you know, the classes, you know, talk about his work. And they're all yelling at him. You can't do this. You're not allowed to do this. You can't do this. You can't. All this thing. So I let him go on for like five minutes. And then so I, I just, he's a white guy. And I, and I said, can you write a story about a black guy raping a white woman? And they went, yes. And I went, okay. Can he write a story about a black guy raping a white woman? And they went, Yes. And it's not like I want a ton of stories about black guys raping white women. But, and I said, well, now talk to him. And then their, their critique was so good. Because it wasn't about the act. It was about how are you rendering this act? How are you, what are all these kind of stereotypes? You know what I mean? It's like, how do you tell this story? And then when I, when I met with him afterwards, I mean, he took it beautifully. And I was like, yeah, I know what you're trying to do. And I go, you know, in some ways you've done yourself a favor. I said, you stepped on every landmine you could possibly step on your first time out, you know? But now in some ways you've cleared a path a little bit. And that's kind of what you have done. It, but, it's, yeah. but the thing is, sometimes you want to step on the landmine, you know? And I was like, all it is is now, you know, all this stuff is out there. And now you just got to be considerate about where you want to place your feet. And you can step anywhere you want to step. But I think the thing is, just think about it for two seconds. You know, and I mean, that's, that's what makes anything good is you just, you have to, you know, not anything, but you know, sometimes things just, you know, you vomit it out and it happens to be good. But, you know, it's just, it's just that, you know. And so for me, it's not about censorship or any of that kind of stuff. It's about just acknowledging that, you know, your words have an impact, you know, and, and, and not backing off from that. You know, you're allowed to be as offensive or whatever you want to be, you know, but not, but there's also another context to that. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know quite how to answer that. Sorry. Thank you. Who's next? That gentleman over there. Uh, what's your name, sir? I don't know where we I'm looking. Oh, you. okay. We, we can't hear you. The mic is not on. It's okay? It's audible now? Yes, we can hear you. Myself is Umesh Prasad from the University of Calcutta. I teach and read English literature and also creative writing. After reading your book with rapt attention, I have come across a certain figures, that is levels. There were discussions on levels. Levels means nothing. It is the streams of consciousness. It is the streams of consciousness technique and the referential textuality, which you have mentioned in your book, 
with respect to collective guilt, I want to have the clarification on that particular fundamental phenomenon. Thank yeah. you for the attention. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it comes from a, I, I can speak from my perspective, you know, being a, a black male in the States, is that you always feel like you're a representative of something bigger. So that gets very exhausting. Uh, and then what also comes with that is, I remember two, I, I was in college and these two guys had gotten to a big argument, turned public, and another black kid to me, said to me, he goes, I am so embarrassed. And, and I went, why are you so embarrassed? Like, that has nothing to do with you. You can't let someone else's perception of how you should or shouldn't be. If they, I mean, you can't, it's easy for me to say that. I mean, I completely understood what he meant. But it's like, it's just, so I try not to do that. And I try to think about what the collective thing is for me when that applies to me when it doesn't. Because it doesn't. You know, identity shifts all the time. You know, my sense of collectiveness shifts, you know. And, and so when I first started writing, my first book was this book called The White Boy Shuffle. And I was in London, and a, another young writer stopped me. And he was like, I want to thank you so much. And this happened to me in the States. And I was like, okay, uh, you're welcome. I don't know. I don't have to tell you why. And he goes, you have this line in your book where that, you know, because you're, I think part of it is you're constantly told how to be black or how not to be black, how to do this. So it, there's a weird kind of collective consciousness that forms. And he goes, there's a line in the book where the guy says, hey, stay black. And, and the guy says, well, what does that mean? He goes, yeah, just be yourself. You know, and so, and it, it just, I mean, it's so simple to me, but it's like this thing. And, and then I was just in London not so long ago. And a, and a guy was saying to me, well, yeah, I feel another black writer. He said, I feel like it's my job to educate white people and do this. And I was like, well, I'm glad you have that job because I don't <laughs> fucking want it. <laughs> you know, and it's this thing about like who you're, you know, and it just, and so, you know, my wife, she always talks about, you know, like, because this thing is like a thing I get asked a lot. You haven't asked it, thank goodness. Is, who's your audience? Who's your audience? And it's not something I think about very much. So I realize I'm just not the only weirdo. Like, there's some other weirdos out there. You know, that's another collective for me that's important. And I'm going to, Althea have heard me tell this story before, but, like, we're talking about this political correctness, these, these levels, these, these layers, a stream of consciousness. So my wife's a big Rolling Stones fan. And her favorite song, because we talk about this, you know, this, this cognitive dissonance all the time. And she talks about how her favorite Rolling Stones song is Under My Thumb. And you listen to the lyrics of that song, and it's deeply misogynist. It's a hateful, mean song. But the way she talks about it, ah, there's something undeniable there. You know, and that's, that's a real struggle. That it's easy to pretend like, that you have nothing to do with that. Like, I don't know, these frailties never really get, ex very rarely get exaggerated. You know, because there's hero worship, but there's kind of a self-hero worship also. You know, and part of Trump's thing, back to that, is there's another kind of white American self-hatred that never gets talked yeah. about, you know? And, and, and it's just these things, these layerings of things that, It's you interesting know. you said that because some, you sometimes see white Americans, if other Americans are behaving or having a fight or behaving in a certain way, they say, well, I'm really embarrassed by that. Yeah, and yeah, no, none that, of this yeah, is specific yeah, yeah, yeah. to who, no, who I am demographically. Yeah, yeah. It's just how yeah. we all think, yeah, you know, at so some I level. Yeah, yeah. And I always say, same thing, why are you uh, embarrassed yeah. by that? Yeah. Anyway, who's next? Uh, can we have um, this lady over here? Hi. Um, that was a really wonderful reading. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess I want to ask a little bit about narrative trust and, and not so much as kind of a reliable or unreliable narrator, but more because there is an element of absurdity to the prose and it's, it's almost like tethering an absurdity all the time, like bursting at the seam and that's what gives it pace and energy and, and and I wonder, and this might be a tenuous link, what it means to craft that kind of narrative trust where the reader is willing to go along wherever you're taking them at a time when identity, or like crafting identity or identity politics are in, in such a flux too. And, and it, it kept making me think about kind of this, this Foucault's prediction of identity being the future currency of politics yeah. and, and how easily it, you know, kind of, minority discourses either get co-opted by the mainstream or get or, or alternatively disenfranchised um, minorities over identify um, yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I don't think I can answer that question as eruditely as you asked it, but yeah. So one of the early readings I did is actually a friend came up to me and went, "This is not absurdity. This is not satire. This is reportage." You know, that, that made me so happy in a weird way. Because I think often we're not always willing to accept how absurd people's lives are, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's hard to do. So in terms of this book, you know, so the community is set in this little small place, this little whatever an American inner city ghetto is, but it's an agricultural setting. And so that's actually based on a real place in Los Angeles. That's not like the book, but it's a place where you drive through and you see people on horseback riding, riding into the store, or you turn the corner, there's 100 chickens in the street, you know, people graze their goats, you know, in the middle of LA. So it's a weird little thing that nobody knows about. And then, so I'm trying to write that out. And that's like, yeah, how do I get this to read funny, absurd, and real at the same time? And it just takes time. It took me, it was the hardest thing to do. You know, so it took me like literally two years to find the tone of it. You know, where's, and so for me, part of that is what do I label and what don't I label? So, so there's certain names I don't use in the book. And then so people come up to me and go, so that's supposed to be so-and-so, that's supposed to be so-and-so. Half the time they're wrong. Every now and then somebody's right. But it's because I don't want the people to be specific about that, well, to tell me how that's not real or how this is, you know, so. You barely use the name of your main character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and then so it's, because, and so part of the absurdity is just really writing with that confidence. You know, this is what this world is, you know. And so for me, it took me a long time to convince my own self of that. It took a while, you know. And it's, you know, it's all memory. I know there's this panel that's happening for me, is, which is so important about memory and fiction. You know, it's crazy, but that's, the kernel usually is in there, you know? Because that, that way you can set your memory in any time, in any place. Because it's based on these things that we're talking about that are sort of, I'm gonna say, you know, common ground, you know, at some level. And uh, yeah, I don't have a more concrete way of talking about it. But it's, part of it is, is writing with a confidence of, yeah, this is what this world is, you know? And, you know, it's like, how open do you leave that, the door open for interpretation, you know? Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one, possibly two more questions. Um, gentleman over here. Yeah, hi, Paul. I just love your book. Thank uh, you. The question is that, uh, uh, while writing the book, uh, is there by any way, uh, a classic of American literature, The Killer Mockingbird, Atticus haunted you? That Killer Mockingbird haunted me? Yeah. Just that word shifferobe haunted me. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows this word shifferobe. But there's a guy in the, in the book who's always busting up the shifferobe. So I love that word. And so that word haunted me. And in some, in some level, the tone of that book haunted me about like what America is, what the judicial system is. It wasn't like that big of a thing, but shifferobe definitely haunted me. But one of the things is that I, I didn't realize how much a book meant to me until I was talking about it not so long ago was G.K. Chesterton's The Man Who Was Thursday. I don't know if people know this book. I guess not. But, uh, Tell us about it. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful book. 1905, maybe, this book is written. And Chesterton is a guy who, who just talks about being lost. Talks about what he's... I'm reading this book now, which I hadn't read, which I'm embarrassed, you know... Uh, uh, you know, and it's, it's basically about Trump's America, you know, about what happens when you have a government in place and no one gives a fuck, you know? What's that, and it's just, and there's just an irreverence and a, a you know, and, and, and just, you know, this, this idea of how you don't have to serve your masters, how you don't have to be in that sluice of life, or how you can be in the sluice and be going, hey, we're all in the sluice, I know it, you don't know it, you know? Lucky me, I guess, <laughs> you know. But uh, that's, that's the book. So it's not, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, except for that word. Uh, one final question. Who's going to ask it? Lady over there? You have good eyes. I can't see <laughs> Hi, I'm Shriya. Hi. I want to know what is that one question that you really want to be asked? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is... What is it that you want to talk about? Yeah, I, I don't know what that is. It's different on different days. Um, 
What is it to me? I have a, can I ask the audience a question? Am I Go allowed ahead. to do that? You can ask. So one of the things people are always asking me is, how do you think that this book translates here? So yeah, in Italy they go, how does this book trend? I'm really curious, like, because the book is yeah. so me, you know, forget yeah. that it's so American, you know, it's so me, you know. And so what's this, what's, well, who's the woman that just asked the question? There she is. Huh? No, no, this woman that there just. There she is. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read the book? <laughs> you read the book, this guy oh. who asked me to kill a mockingbird. How, what's, what, what's translating from the book here? For me, this is interesting. So this is taking audience questions to a whole new level, but this is a good one. <laughs> Actually, the you mean book, the guy behind? But the, yeah, him, uh, yeah. when you when you read this book, r between the lines, each and every line has a consciousness. That's what I find. Now he's asking how the does sense. Yeah, no, 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 no. Let me let me let me first of all communicate okay. the sense of communication and sense of consciousness, which I feel it is related to Graham Greene. Graham Greene's Power and the Glory. Graham Greene has written that book. And D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers. It has a link with creativity. It has a link with transformational and transformative change. And it has a link with university wits, writers, to which the scholasticism has evolved. And the sense of evolution and the sense of involution, both are intermingled in this text. This is what I, I feel is scholastic definition to this. Yeah. I mean, so this is like something that, you know, people rarely talk about, you know, for him, like, so I've read this much D.N. Lawrence and I haven't read any Graham Greene, you know, so I would always get Thomas Pynchon, everyone, you know, and I, so I've stopped, I've refused to read Thomas Pynchon because I just don't want to know, you know, but there's a thing for me that, that there's this presumption about like how things translate, should they translate, and it's that Consciousness, I don't know, it's that, that stuff between the lines that translates, that, or doesn't translate. But you can, it's like music a little bit, you know? And for me it's interesting, because I'm curious about like how people are responding and, which is not, I, I know I'm cheating a little bit on your question, <laughs> but it's, it's mostly because I don't like talking about what I do, so. But for me it's really interesting to hear that. And, and, and it's, I mean, it's how I work. That's what appropriation, whatever that fucking word means. But that's how it works, is that, you know, we hear different things, you know, different things. And so, and so for, for me, I, I try to give myself the liberty, not, it's, I, I don't consider it appropriation, I'm just living my life, you know. And, you know, somebody asked me a question about slavery, da, 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 and all this other crap. And I was like, oh, the best movie I've ever seen on slavery is this Japanese movie, Mizuguchi Sancho the Bailiff, which is this fucking beautiful movie. And it's the best movie I've ever seen about slavery. You know, but it's all these things about what translates, grief, freedom, all this kind of stuff. And yeah, I know I'm not really answering the question, but there's not something that I'm dying to talk about, really, to be honest. Well, I think we've run out of time, but thank you, Paul. Thanks for and having me. And thank you to the audience for asking so many wonderful questions. Yeah. And welcome. Yeah, and thank you. I'd love to know what you think about India over the next two weeks so, that you're here. Sure, sure, thank sure, you. Sure. Okay, thank you very much to Paul and Meru. Uh, there will be, Paul will be signing his book just over in the book signing counter just over there. So please support Paul and uh, go and say hello to him. So we have our next session coming up, The Legacy of the Left, starting at 3.45 p.m. So I look forward to seeing some of you back here then. Thank you.